Benchmark, the voice of business, presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, KPMG Principal of the Taxing Regulatory Division, Suresh Pereira joins us today as we take a closer look at Sri Lanka's tax environment. The BCI continues to be flat. Nielsen's Managing Director Shine Carter analyzes biz sentiment. And the last word goes to Deshal Jamel, economist and LMD columnist, who gives us his unique perspective on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and thank you for joining Benchmark, the Big Picture Business Program. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. In the hot seat today is the Principal of the Tax and Regulatory Division of KPMG Sri Lanka, Suresh Pereira, and he's joining us to talk about some much oft discussed issues on taxation here in Sri Lanka. Suresh will give us his expert opinion on the IRD's new revenue administration management information system, tax evasion maybe, and a lot of other issues that we discuss quite frequently. So without further ado, welcome Suresh to Benchmark. Nice Hello. to have you on the show. If we were just to begin this uh, program and, and to give some sort of uh, a background to the whole uh, issue that we are discussing, what is the tax environment like in Sri Lanka at this point of time? Well, the tax environment. Well, Sri Lanka has a fascinating web of taxes and uh, both the direct taxes and ind indirect taxes. There is income tax, there is economic service charge, and there is a plethora of indirect taxes, VAT, NBT, uh, uh, ports and airport development levy, uh, customs duty, excise duty, so on and so forth. So in, apart from the taxes that are there, then there are institutions that administer these uh, fiscal levies. There is the main, main one, of course, is the Department of Indian Revenue, uh, administered by the Commission General of Indian Revenue, then the Customs Department. And we do have a, I would say that we have a satisfactory tax system. Of course, there are ups and downs, uh, there are minuses and uh, the pluses, but overall I would see that it's a satisfactory system. We do have uh, to look after the interest of the taxpayers. There is an appellate procedure. We have four stage appellate procedure. First, uh, first stage the Commissioner General. Uh, the second appeal is to the Tax Appeals Commission. And then, on a question of law, an aggrieved taxpayer can go to the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. Well, what I would like to see in addition to what we have, maybe a tax ombudsman. Not to uh, resolve the issues pertaining to interpretation of uh, the tax statutes, but to uh, sort out the disputes between the taxpayers and the tax officers, the administrative aspects of that. And apart from that, in order to uh, bring in more certainty into the tax system, I think an advanced ruling system, an independent advanced ruling system akin to the system that is in India, I think is a welcome move. Suresh. There is a big difference between tax minimization, tax avoidance, and tax evasion. Now, every taxpayer has a right to uh, reduce the amount of taxes they pay as long as it's within the legal limits. But when it comes to tax, tax evasion, that is illegal. What are your views on the levels of tax evasion in the country? Well, that is a very difficult question to answer. I have to have a little bit of astrology behind me to tell what is the level of tax evasion. But uh, of course, uh, we can get an indication when we look at the number of tax files that are being maintained by the Inland Revenue Department. Now, let's say, uh, in, according to the 2012 records, if I recall, in case of individuals, uh, there were about there were less than 200,000 tax files. Uh, pay tax. I think there are about 5 lakhs or a little bit uh, above 5 lakhs uh, pay records. Uh, in relation to corporates, companies that is, there are about 32,000 uh, tax file. Now, is this all? That is the question. So, what do you make of voluntary taxpayers being audited 
and allegedly harassed sometimes when the Inland Revenue Department needs to meet its targets. Yeah, this is a very unfortunate situation. I would say that uh, this is something that uh, should not happen. Yes, when the targets are being uh, set and the problem comes because within a limited period, uh, the officers are expected to gather revenue. So they tend to take shortcuts. So what do they do? Instead of going uh, outside the existing uh, taxpayers and trying to bring new taxpayers into the net, what they try to do is they take the existing taxpayer and try to collect more taxes from the same taxpayer. This is where the uh, problem comes. Suresh, looking at the individual taxpayer, is there sufficient financial literacy for them to actually understand not only the tax administration, the processes that go into that, but also the implications of the government's tax policies? Okay, two different things. If you take a lay person, does he understand the tax law? Tax law is very complicated. Even for a lawyer, you will find nowadays lawyers, there are less lawyers uh, specializing in taxation. That is because they also sometimes find uh, taxes uh, too complicated. So I have a lot of sympathy towards uh, non uh, the lay people with regard to taxation because there are so many complicated tax rules and it's not easy to understand. Apart from that, when the tax laws are introduced, when new tax incentives are introduced, is the message going to the relevant taxpayers? That's a big question mark. I'll give you a good example. During the last uh, few years, there have been many tax incentives that have been introduced to the SME sector. Now, SME sector compared to the corporate sector is, I would say, less educated. And uh, I don't see this tax incentive that have been introduced their benefit being understood by them. They are not aware. I find many taxpayers coming to me basically and uh, they are not aware these tax incentives are there for their businesses. So I think there is a big gap here. One is the tax rules are complicated. The other one is the rules that are being introduced even for the benefit of the taxpayers are not being communicated or are they, they are not reaching to the uh, reaching the taxpayers. Right. So. Okay, let's move to the big business then, or the businesses that are working uh, in, in the larger sphere. Uh, will this new revenue administration management system that the IRD is uh, to be to introduce it going to improve the situation? I know that it will be linked to the Department of Motor Traffic, for instance, customs, excise, uh, you name it, and uh, a personal identification number is to be introduced for people to access their tax records and to do their tax work. Do you think it's going to improve the situation, or will it just get more, even more complicated? No. Now let's let's uh, let's try to understand what this uh, remis is all about. Remis is all about the tax administration. This is not about the tax policy or the tax rules. Uh, this is to help the inland Department of Inland Revenue do their job properly. Uh, this is a system that was uh, introduced or rather mentioned at the last budget. In fact. Uh, I thought when that was mentioned, okay, this is just going to be a mentioning of a system and this will never uh, materialize. But uh, I find that uh, right now there are meetings happening and there is an uh, effort to ensure that the system will be in place by maybe 2015. So things are moving. And of course, once this system is introduced, I think there will be a big change in the tax culture. Tax evasion will be difficult. So there may be sometimes this film, this may help the Inland Revenue Department to ensure that they are going in their direction of uh, meeting their targets. And meeting in more people. Exactly. To the tax. So we pause for a few commercials now. When we return, Suresh Pereira talks about the recent rollout of the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act and the tax holidays that are offered to businesses. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed.
We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. As soon as my salary goes into my HNB account, my family goes shopping just like a power play. Now with HNB Mobile Banking, wherever you are in the world, you can check your account balance and do your banking with this. Wherever I am in the world, HNB is active on my mobile and tap 24 hours a day. HNB Mobile Banking. Bank anywhere from any mobile. Welcome back to Benchmark, our big picture business program. We now continue our interview with Suresh Pereira, the principal of the Tax and Regulatory Division of KPMG Sri Lanka. Um, Suresh, a very interesting rollout has happened um, with the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Now, that act is mainly a, an anti-tax avoidance law. Uh, how will this impact Sri Lankan companies? Right. FATCA is a law introduced uh, in USA. That is to prevent uh, US citizens who are outside US uh, from evading uh, their taxes. In, in case of USA, unlike uh, Sri Lanka and most of the other countries, uh, the concept of taxation is based on citizenship. Now, in case of Sri Lanka, it's the concept of residency. So any person, any US uh, citizen who's outside uh, US uh, earning revenue must pay their taxes to the US uh, government. And they found that uh, that it was uh, there was a big uh, gap between uh, that uh, the how is the compliance by the U.S. citizens. So U.S. Congress came up with this uh, piece of legislation to ensure that they will uh, collect their due revenue. The mechanism is there is a burden uh, imposed on foreign financial institutions say the banks or any institution that is acting in the capacity of custodian, uh, deposit taking institutions, uh, investment vehicles, so and so forth, uh, that they will report about the US citizens offshore assets to uh, US IRS. So what happened in Sri Lanka? In fact, uh, we started getting ready for uh, this system quite late. There are, there are three different models in which uh, this system uh, could work, but in Sri Lanka, the government of Sri Lanka has not uh, signed an agreement with the uh, US government in order to uh, execute the program, the scheme. What is happening in Sri Lanka is the Sri Lankan financial institutions themselves have uh, entered into agreements with the US IRS and is complying with the uh, provisions. In other words, they have, they have uh, registered to report U.S. citizens' uh, uh, assets to U.S. IRS uh, starting from I think the first reporting day is the 31st of March 2014, 15, 2015. Now, very recently, or last year really, uh, it was reported that a multi-million dollar foreign company operating in Sri Lanka uh, was probed for allegedly engaging in tax evasion and a very reputed financial auditing firm was accused of covering up the wrongdoing. Given FATCA and what it actually does, could a similar mechanism be introduced by Sri Lanka to safeguard tax evasion? Right. FATCA is all about preventing offshore tax evasion. Now, we have to look at it in the context of the Sri Lankan citizens. Now, are we talking about Sri Lankans evading taxes uh, with regard to their offshore revenues? Well. Most of the offshore earnings of the Sri Lankans under uh, different rules are exempt. But at the same time, there are certain criteria that should be fulfilled to enjoy that exemption. Now, for instance, a US uh, a Sri Lankan service provider providing services to a person outside Sri Lanka and uh, earning foreign currency, and if that foreign currency is remitted through a bank account, is exempt from income tax. 
So there are specific exemptions, but that exemption gets triggered only if the revenue is brought to Sri Lanka. So from that context, yes, if we can have a mechanism of uh, mechanic, mechanism similar to FATCA, yes, it could be beneficial to the Sri Lankan Inland Revenue Department, but I don't think Sri Lanka will go in that direction at all because we don't have the infrastructure or the political ability to implement. What US did is a phenomenal thing. I don't think any other government in the world would be in a position to implement a scheme of this nature. But having said that, I have to mention that OECD has come up with a framework to ensure that there will not be uh, offshore tax evasion. They are coming at a framework called Common Reporting Standards. This is where two governments, say Sri Lanka and India, will sign an agreement to exchange information. Suresh, speaking of which, tax holidays, are these really working in Sri Lanka's favour? Well, in case of Sri Lanka, tax holidays come from uh, the Inland Revenue Act as well as right now under the what is called the Strategic Development Authority scheme. Once upon a time, Board of Investment of Sri Lanka also used to exercise their legislative power and grant uh, tax holidays, but uh, nowadays uh, that is not happening. And the, if you trace the history of the tax holidays, I think uh, it was in 1978 the BOI was uh, introduced and the tax holidays uh, commenced probably from that era outside the Inland Revenue Department. We find that Sri Lankan Inland Revenue Department is not meeting targets. So I don't know whether it's uh, there's a connection between uh, that and the tax holidays. I think it's very difficult to say that and I don't think anybody has done an in-depth study on this issue. So it's uh, difficult to make a comment on that. But there is a school of thought that uh, it is not tax holidays that attract uh, FDI or the foreign investors into the country. It is the creation of the political stability and the tax certainty in the free, uh, country that uh, attracts the FDI. Let's talk about the revision of VAT, NBT, PAL, um, the exemption of corporate income tax. When all these are put together, uh, the, the budget 2014 actually introduced concessions for these areas. So these tax provisions, are they happening right now or have they kept changing along the way? No, the budget, I think the budget proposals that were introduced have been legislated and they are in operation now. So they are in effect. Uh, let's see the proposals that were introduced uh, with regard to uh, VAT and the uh, indirect taxes uh, came into operation with effect from 1st of uh, January and uh, income tax and uh, economic service charge, uh, the amendments with effect from 1st of April are in operation. What are your expectations of Budget 2015? I hope the tax policy that was uh, embraced in 2011 will continue. That should not affect because of the uh, failure of the Inland Revenue Department to meet the targets. In other words, there should not be deviation from the tax policy of uh, tax policy introduced in uh, 2011 to broaden the tax base and simplify the tax system. In other words, I hope that there will not be uh, increase of the tax rates. And I do take uh, comfort uh, uh, with regard to this matter uh, from a statement that uh, Dr. Jayasundara made recently, where he has said that there will not be uh, increase of uh, tax rates merely because tax to GDP ratio is falling. What we need to do, as he rightly pointed out, is to promote new growth areas and to extract taxes from those growth areas in order to ensure the tax to GDP ratio in the country will increase. What do I expect from this budget? From my angle, I would like to see tax amendments being introduced to promote what's called REITs. Real Estate Investment Trust. Now, this is a concept that uh, the Securities Exchange of uh, Securities Exchange Commission of Sri Lanka is trying to introduce in Sri Lanka, and that will have a big impact on the real estate market. So, I hope that uh, those uh, proposals would be accepted and be implemented. That's one area. In apart from that, I don't think it will be uh, introduced in uh, this budget, though. Uh, this is the concept of group taxation. I think now Sri Lanka is ready to. Uh, go into group taxation. So probably this budget 
I don't think it will happen in this budget, but probably in the future, in the next five years, I would expect that also to come into the Sri Lankan tax system. So we do hope your wishes and expectations for budget 2015 come true, Suresh. It's been great talking to you. So we've been talking to the principal of the Tax and Regulatory Division of KPMG Sri Lanka, Suresh Pereira. On the other side, we have economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel, who will give you a little more about the economy, and the managing director of Nielsen Shaheen Kader on the BCI. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. As soon as my salary goes into my HNB account, my family goes shopping just like a power play. Now with HNB Mobile Banking, wherever you are in the world, you can check your account balance and do your banking with this. Wherever I am in the world, HNB is active on my mobile and tap 24 hours a day. HNB Mobile Banking. Bank anywhere from any mobile. Welcome back to the show. We'll take a closer look now at the latest on the Business Confidence Index with the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. Uh, so Shaheen, the BCI has remained more or less flat in recent times. What has led to this situation? Yeah. Actually, in the last three months, uh, the index has been flat. Uh, what we see is that, you know, uh, more businesses are optimistic about the future of the economy and their businesses than, than pessimistic. However, you know, this optimism is, is flat. There's, it's not increased. So what we see now is really, you know, basically a, not a sense of pessimism, but we see, a, you know, optimism being uh, being stagnant in that sense. So where do respondents stand in terms of the economy? Is the prognosis good or bad? Um, I th respondents have said, you know, they are more positive than negative about the economy, but I think the concern is that, uh, uh, you know, despite uh, worries about inflation coming down, investor sentiment has declined. I mean, with for, for example, we see that you know, in, in uh, July, 43% were negative about investor sentiment compared to 22% a month ago. So it basically doubled. So that's something that we need to keep an eye on. Now, you mentioned 43% who are concerned about the investment climate. Now, what are the sensitivities behind uh, their response? I think some of the concern areas which are remaining at a high level are, I think, uh, this whole, with the, you know, whenever elections come up, uh, you know, we see concerns because perceptions of political interference affecting business and so, so this is one aspect and also the the the, the continuing uh, negative on high uh, basic cost of goods and services and also import and other taxes so those are some of the concerns that are still there that was the managing director of Nielsen Shaheen Kader after a short commercial break we'll take a closer look at the economy stay tuned When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed.
We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. As soon as my salary goes into my HNB account, my family goes shopping just like a power play. Now with HNB Mobile Banking, wherever you are in the world, you can check your account balance and do your banking with this. Wherever I am in the world, HNB is active on my mobile and tap 24 hours a day. HNB Mobile Banking. Bank anywhere from any mobile. Hello and welcome back to the show. We take a closer look at our economy now and with me is economist and LMD columnist Deshal Timel. Now uh, Deshal, the IMF, both the IMF and Standard & Poor's have re updated their views on Sri Lanka. Now uh, what do they cite as significant risks as far as future ratings are concerned? Yes, Anush, and uh, in addition to those two, Moody's as well, all three have uh, given recent um, uh, recent reviews of Sri Lanka's economy. Uh, both Standard & Poor's and Moody's have, uh, have revised Sri Lanka's um, Sri Lanka's rating and their outlook uh, and the IMF as well recently concluded the article uh, for consultations. Now all three agencies cite a number of positives uh, mainly relating to Sri Lanka's continuing strong growth profile, uh, decline, significant declines in inflation compared to historical averages, uh, improved current account balances on the external uh, external sector and also in some cases improvements in the performance of state-owned enterprises. So all of these are areas that have previously been significant uh, risk areas and they've all uh, improved quite significantly. Now the, the common area where there is still um, a red flag highlighted uh, to an extent is Sri Lanka's external debt. And now both uh, Moody's and Standard and, and Poor have um, highlighted the fact that Sri Lanka, particularly compared to uh, uh, similar rated peers in the Asia Pacific region, Sri Lanka doesn't perform, perform particularly well in terms of external debt. If we take, for instance, um, uh, Sri Lanka's total external debt as a percentage of GDP, uh, it's around 59%, and that uh, when you include that is uh, the uh, debt obligations of state-owned enterprises as well, uh, that compares quite uh, is maybe there are two countries uh, that perform worse than Sri Lanka on that matrix. Uh, furthermore, if you look at Sri Lanka's uh, outstanding total government debt as a percentage of government revenue, again it is um, only only uh, better than Japan and Lebanon. So <coughs> there are. In, in many of these uh, many of these matrices, Sri Lanka doesn't perform particularly well, uh, and I think that is the one area where they uh, they see that um, the the risk profile still remains relatively elevated compared to uh, what most of the other areas have been. Now, in the light of this, Deshal, how would adverse developments in the global market affect our economy? If you look at Sri Lanka's external debt profile, the there is no real imminent disc, uh, risk of default there. Uh, what you would see as a, a major a major concern would be if there is a, a, a downturn in global capital markets that makes it more difficult for Sri Lanka to access capital markets to roll over the recent uh, debt that they have taken. Uh, so that is really the most uh, the most pressing immediate risk that I would see. Uh, and of course there are other important uh, important areas in terms of Sri Lanka's exports and uh, import uh, access. Of course Sri Lanka is rel being a relatively small economy. Global markets are crucial particularly in terms of um, export of goods and export of uh, services. So those are areas that are, are generally uh, generally issues in for any kind of uh, relatively small uh, small island economy. But the real, ca the, real uh, the, the real risk would be in terms of uh, a freezing up of global capital markets due to a, a significant uh, risk perception in uh, among global investors. Now demand for credit still appears to be weak, so why is the central bank continuing to hold rates low? Uh, so the central bank has been reducing policy rates for quite a long cycle now since um, this, uh, for more than almost almost two years now um, and the thinking there is that uh, look we have reduced policy interest rates to a significant amount I mean it's almost at historical lows uh, but there are still there's still a little bit of room for market interest rates to decline I mean if you look at again uh, the prime lending rate that has also come down to very low levels uh, but that is really applies only to your prime, your best customers. Whereas if you also look at uh, some of the 
lending to uh, lending rates to subprime pro customers whilst they have also come down significantly there's still uh, a little bit more room for uh, for those rates to come down so because of that average lending rates are still probably a little bit higher than uh, than they than they could be uh, so i think the central bank's thinking in this case would be to give a little bit more time for these uh, for those rate reductions to filter through across the entire spectrum of uh, of borrowers and that is uh, it's happening you can see that in the, as markets continue to reprice interest rates across the border continue to decline so i think the central bank is giving a little bit of time for that to fully feed through and also uh, given the recent situation in terms of um, the drought and how that has, has affected uh, food production agricultural production and that the resulting impacts on uh, on prices and inflation um, the central bank may also be uh, concerned that they would not want to see a knock on effect of that as well so i think those two reasons have slightly made them a little bit more cautious in terms of uh, of further reductions in uh, in the immediate future that was the economist and LMD columnist Dashal Dimel. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.